So. All right, well, thanks for calling. I actually am going to go to a song here because we are going to connect with the United Kingdom and talk to David Donnelly from the Venus Reaction. So, Joe, thanks for calling into the Kiss Room. Obviously, if you have any more updates between now and the time of your party, you can post them in the group and let us know. I'll do that. Take care, guys. See ya. Okay, so coming up now, we have the Venus Reaction. Now, look, a lot of you last month that, that really enjoyed the Kiss Room Demos Project, I love when we get our talented Kiss fan friends to send us stuff. I got this song from David Donnelly. We're going to connect with him right after this. You're in the Kiss Room on Monaco Radio, where music and minds meet. Yeah. 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 All right, now let's see if this works. David Donnelly, are you on the line? Oh, I am on the line. Fantastic. Look at that. Coming in through Skype. You know, like now normally we just talk to those guys on the phone. I hate using Skype in the studio because what I just yeah. found out was the Skype isn't working on the station computer, so it's actually running through my phone right now. So it's uh... All right, okay. <laughs> I'm looking at a laptop. <laughs> there you go. Well, that sounded great. The song was great. So tell tell us obviously the uh the so the band is the Venus Reaction and that's crashing yeah. up and tell tell us about it. Um, well, it's just, you know, I, I've spent the last 10 years as a sort of session guy playing behind and, and beside, you know, quite a, a, you know, a lot of really cool artists and stuff. But uh, I always wrote my own stuff. And it was I kind of I kind of took the kiss model, you know, when they said about the band that you always wanted to see. Um, and when I sort of thought I want to do something of my own, I thought, well, who would I have in it? And so I sort of put out a wish list, as it were, for myself. And um, and I got everyone. I got everyone I wanted. Um, it's me on guitar. It's uh, the the rather uh, delicious Amy Conradine on vocals, and uh, Glenn Matlock on bass, and uh, we've got Ed Graham um, on drums. Cool. And uh, so you know, it's it's kind of like an all star lineup except me. <laughs> <laughs> Now we were you were t saying that now I want to take credit for this. This is the first international broadcast of the song. Yeah, I've tried to do some. I've tried to do this single differently to because when you're in the industry, it can become a bit of a sort of like a, I don't know. It's, it's there's bits of it that aren't pleasant and what have you. And the machine, you know, you you, you witness the machine, and I wanted to do it outside the machine. So th the first thing I thought of was like you know podcasts rather than radio stations. I mean, I, I could probably pull a few strings to get on. The radio stations you're supposed to get on, but I don't want to, and that's the reason. That's the reason why it's on a seven-inch clear vinyl single as well. It's, it's a seven-inch clear vinyl single with a picture sleeve. Um, inside there is a download card with extra goodies on it and a, and a, and a bonus track, but um, you know which you got to do these days. But I just love records, man. I really do, and I'm so excited to be on the Kiss Room. It's just mad. I mean, I, I, you know. I, I'm so nervous. I, I've walked out in front. I've walked out in front of forty-five thousand people, and it hasn't bothered me at all at a festival or something. But this is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> no, look, this is the Point. most fun. Now, Watch. obviously, that's the one thing I was going to say. Was obviously the, you know, when people are tuned in, the band is called the Venus Reaction, and, the, and they're thinking they're tuned into the Kiss Room. But I love the fact that Kiss fans that go on and do fun, creative things. So obviously, tell us how you became a Kiss fan, and then how it influenced obviously the music that we're hearing now well uh, basically I, my, my my introduction was quite odd really in terms of my first record and things like that i mean when i was 11 years old we we moved my family moved to a town called a city called norwich in uh, in england and uh, my mother said to me uh, you should go next door and see the the kid next door he's really into music so i went and sort of knocked on the door and he showed me his room and the first thing i saw was you know those massive posters that used to take up a ceiling you know, yeah. the, the, it was what it was like. The, the it was like an, a live photo, round about I'd say a seventy-seven photo. Uh, you know, poster. Sorry, you know, massive poster. And I pointed at it and just said, "Who's that?" And um, he said, "Oh, it's Kiss." And he he pulled out a copy of Alive Two, and the picture was Gene on the front with the blood and everything. But the wit and, and so I was blown away. He put that on, and, and that was it for me. But the funny thing is that this guy, he went on holiday very shortly after that to Canada, and he came back um, with what he thought was a new Kiss record, but he'd not seen just because he'd not seen it before. And he he came round to mine. He said, "You can have this. I don't like it. it. Doesn't sound very good." And so my very first Kiss record that I had was the Takes Tokyo '77 bootleg. Wow. Um, wow, and then my sister went on holiday to America when I was about 12 and she came back and she bought, um, I know you're going to laugh at my pronunciation, but she brought back Dynasty with her. 
No, that's right. Um, I thought you were going to say dynasty, right? That's what we said. Yeah. Well, I, I would have said dynasty, you see, but I thought, you know, <laughs> you'd, you'd uh, yeah, you'd take the mick out of me. But uh, so, J. funnily R. enough, Khan, yeah. you know, dynasty was my first uh, owned record, you know, like first proper Kiss album. And then from then on, it was just every, you've probably heard it a thousand times, every Christmas, every birthday, can I, I want Dressed to Kill, Hot to Hell, Hot, Hot Than Hell, a live one. And like your um, your previous guest, you know, it was one of those things that because I try I tried to play everything drums, bass, guitar, what have you, which has done me all right career wise, you know. But um, I, I could play along, you know. There was there was nothing not having a go at Peter, but um, you know, there was nothing that Peter could do that I couldn't have a crack at, even at sort of you know fourteen, fifteen, and um, you know, I could pick up the riffs and stuff. So, but it was just. Kiss are just, di- I know it's an obvious thing to say, but Kiss are just different from every other band in the world. You know, there's just, there just isn't a comparison. And so, um, you know, always trying to do something just slightly different. And so, in a weird way, I could connect it to my single, I guess, because I've just tried to do things a different way. No PR people, no management, no record pluggers, just me doing it, trying to get it to people who enjoy it, basically. Absolutely. Now, Jerry, you had a question. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't. Okay. I just maybe maybe you could do something for us that'll make us all feel much more comfortable. So you said you were nervous. Can you say these go to eleven? <laughs> <laughs> please, please go to eleven. <laughs> Thank you. See, now we all feel better. <laughs> you know, we were having a good time on Bobby's show at the st- before the kiss room. We were listening oh. to some. Black Sabbath and, and dancing around like it was Stonehenge. It was great. I so, played yeah. hall too. You know? Right, it's, it's all theme act today. I love it. <laughs> Glad I've never done that. No, no, no bad stage sets in my career. <laughs> <laughs> so now talk about that. When's the first time you saw them live? And I, I know it was pretty early. Well, not uh, not early as far as Kiss are concerned. Uh, my my first Kiss gig was the very first reunion shows. Oh, okay. um, in in I saw them at Wembley. Um, on the re- on the first reunion tour, and I remember buying, I bought um, a copy of Kistery on the merch desk, and um, and it was it's it's I don't know whether it's a rare sort of thing, but it's it's signed by like kind of all of them plus uh, I think Bruce and I haven't looked at it for a long time, but the uh, the tracing paper bit seems to have about five signatures on yeah, it. Yeah, when, so, uh, when that first came out, when that first came out, you had the option of of buying. Yeah, yeah, and then I saw the Finsbury Park which was the very last gig of the tour, I believe. Um, and then uh, Psycho Circus, and then a live 35 at Wembley. Um, and this year, oh, man, I, I basically, I, I, do, I do a lot to just, you know, anything to sort of, you know, continue to not have a normal job. And uh, <laughs> so I, I, I'm a producer as well, and I was producing this Swiss band called Dax and Roxanne, and they've got the same PR company as Kiss and Guns N' Roses. And um, and I, I got invited with like all access, and I could have met Paul Stanley the night before because the Dives played the Water Rats in London, and but I couldn't make it. I couldn't do it. I was just I, I was gutted because the guy that their PR guy said, you know, do you want you know do you want to come along? And he was looking after Gene. You know, that was his job for while they were over here was to look after Gene and Paul. You know, and, and uh, I can't believe it. You know, when they played London just a few weeks ago, I, I could have been there. I could have had a night of my life, but I, I couldn't. So uh, there you go. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. a kissed opportunity. <laughs> I know, I know. And, but it's, you know, I was so obsessed when I was a kid. I mean, my, my dad, my dad was a jazz musician, you know, bless him, he's gone now, but uh, he, he, he was a jazz musician. And we went to this thing at Cleo Lane's house. Now, I don't know whether you know who Cleo Lane is, but she's a massive jazz artist. And she just happened to let it slip that uh, on a tour in America, when they come back to England, she she shared a private plane with Kiss. And, uh, you know, there's all these people around her, like, because they're big jazz fans and stuff. And I knew nothing about it at all and stuff. And I was just constantly harassing her about Kiss. You know, what do they look like? And obviously, what a stupid question to ask. They look like the folks. They look, they look like four blokes, you know. I was going, yeah, but what do they, did you get any pictures, you know? And uh, so that, that, that's, um, that my obsession is, is, is huge. And, um, and I, I honestly can't say anything, which is so frustrating. But um, last Saturday, I, I, no, last Sunday, I, um, I spent the day with Alan G. Parker. Really? Um, does, that name, does that name ring any bells so here? So did he tell you if we're ever going to see that movie or not? 
I said to him, I said, what can I say, Alan? What can I said, I'm, I'm going on the kiss room. What, what can I say? And he goes, you can say it exists. Wow. I can't say, I can't say any more than that, but I'd love to. I'd really love to, but I can't. But it Aliens exists. exist too. <laughs> so obviously that's, you know, for anybody that doesn't know the name, obviously he produced You Wanted the Best, You Got the Best, or at least that was the working title of, the, of the documentary. He's and yeah, he's they, directed that movie, so obviously we've never seen it, and it doesn't, it, does it appear, to, did he give you any idea, do you think he's actually going to ever get it distributed? I, I can't say anything, mate, <laughs> honestly. Uh, I, 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 I said to him, I said, can I say anything? And he said, no, he said you can say it exists, and that was the, that's the quote I've got for you, I'm afraid. But uh, maybe, um, you know, maybe in, a, in, in the future I'll come back on and say a lot more. It is nice to know that it does exist. I know they shot a ton of footage for it. You know, we've talked to to a couple different people, even here on the Kiss Room, that had, you know, little bits and pieces about it. But, yeah, I would love to just see it. So, Yeah, I mean, I've basically been, you know, alongside Alan along the journey of this uh, this film. And, uh, you know, obviously we were hoping it it would come out, uh, you know, straight after they'd shot it and stuff because um you know i was fairly sure i'd get a free ticket and a premiere you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh so that would be good but um yeah I, I i i honestly can't say any more but uh you know rest easy <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> Now, and, obviously, um, I, mean, I was going to say real quick, I mean, obviously, what, like, when you think about For Kiss, what are your favorite songs? Who do you gravitate to? Well, I, I, to me, it's uh, I Stole Your Love is always my favorite song, I think. But I do like, I like weird deep cuts, like sort of Ladies Room, Take Me, Mr. Speed, that sort of thing, you know. Um, I do like the dirty, this is, when, whenever there's the, this stupid argument about, you know, Ace and Tommy and all this sort of stuff, it's just I like the dirty rock and roll band, and that's Peter, Ace, Gene, and and Paul. And I totally understand that we've got this cool, you know, this this band that plays perfectly every night these days, you know, and all that sort of stuff with the guitars and, you know, Eric Singer on drums. Amazing. I met Eric Singer, um, top fella, and I, you know, I I still love Kiss and I love the current Kiss, but. Um, for me, it's the fact that with Ace, you just never knew what was going to happen. Anything <laughs> it could fall to bits at any minute, and uh, you know sometimes Peter Chris would do a fill on the drums that almost didn't make it. You know, I just love that, and that's why, you know, like I say, I've got I've got Glenn on my um, on my single, and the weird thing is, I've had at least four friends who their two favourite f- bands have been the Sex Pistols and Kiss. And I wonder whether it's, I wonder whether that's A, because they're bands that both annoy people. <laughs> uh, or, and, you know, there's this, they're a bit sort of like, you know, you love them or hate them type sort of thing. Um, and the other thing is, is just that, uh, you know, they, they had that chaos type side to them, you know, because of all, with Kiss, it was the running around and all that sort of stuff with the pistols. It was because, you know, they, they were just, you know, they were still learning their instruments pretty much <laughs> when, right. they, when they start playing, you know. Um, but yeah, Glenn's told me lots of you know fantastic stories about uh, about about them. And uh, but I've had stories from. There's a Peter Chris story that I I really want to tell, but I I know we're on uh, Montco Radio. Tell so me I've the clean version. <laughs> yeah, give it clean. But I was on tour with a band about three years ago, and I'm not going to say who it is, and I'm not going to say what the person is because he I don't want him to get into trouble. But he basically was asked to go and play bass on. Um, on a swing album that that uh, Peter Chris was putting together, <laughs> and he went to oh, Pete, he went to Peter Chris's house, and apparently he's perfectly welcoming, and everything was going okay. They were sort of having a little, you know, sorting things out. But every time that Peter would go off to the kitchen or go upstairs, he's got he's got gold discs and all sorts of memorabilia on the wall, and every time he would walk past a picture of Jean or Paul, he would stand in front of it. And just scream obscenities and Ooh. various things about wow. and various things, various things relating to what religion they may be and um, things that they should do with their mothers. Um, oh. it, unbelievable, absolutely. And it just—he said it just really weirded him out that he'd be perfectly okay, and then he'd just go and get something, and, and halfway up the stairs he'd just stop and shout, shout something. <laughs> <at> you, <laughs> <sort> of, uh, <laughs> 
I mean, I love him. You've got to love him, haven't you? You know, still tormented <laughs> after all these years. You know, especially after you read his book. I mean, his book. He, I'm, I'm always hoping that he's in a better place than he was when he wrote that book, which he seemed very angry. And when we saw him yeah. in New York this summer, he was great. Like, he, and every time I met him in the last bunch of years, he's always so nice, and he's it's he's so welcoming when you see him, and he's always yeah. you know with a hug and a handshake. And I hope you guys are good. And like the one year I met him was around Thanksgiving, so he's. It was after Thanksgiving, so he's wishing everybody a Merry Christmas. And when we saw him in New York this summer, you know, the big thing, obviously, is all about, you know, get yourself checked out for, you know, men's cancer. Yeah, and and yeah, he couldn't totally, have yeah. been nicer. But, you know, you read the book and, you, and you know, he has such anger. And then to hear a story like that, you say, you know, it's, you know, obviously, look, there's only so many you know, laps around the track. And, and we're probably getting close to the end. We've been saying that for 20 years. But, you know, it's... Yeah. Uh, since the reunion, well, I mean, he I've, can afford better meds, I've met too. Lot, I've, met, <laughs> I've, I've met a lot of people in my in my sort of career that, that, like, you just think, why aren't you happier with what you're doing? Because, I mean, everything I've done, I've just been so chuffed. I mean, last year, I, I was working on an album um, that was being produced by Tony Visconti, you know, Bowie's producer. Yeah, yeah baby. And, and I was sat in the booth with my guitar on my lap, and, you know, Tony's talking to you, you know, and he's going, right, Dave, okay, we're going to... We're going to do it like this, Dave, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And I'm just thinking that's the voice that Bowie heard. That's the voice Mark Boland, Thin Lizzy, you know, amazing, you know. And every time I, I never get sick of it, you right. know, it's, it's, I never get sick of it. And, uh, and I, I have met people where I just think, oh, come on, you could be working in a, I don't know, a, 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 a bank or something. I mean, not, there's nothing wrong with working in a bank, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, running up the down escalator for your entire life. You know, you just sort of think to yourself, just just be happy. Yeah. You know, and uh, and the thing is, you know, again, so, sorry, I keep going back to this because the, the, um, the, the sort of pistols and, uh, and kiss connection. I always think of Gene Simmons like Johnny Rotten because, uh, you know, I've been in a room with Johnny Rotten many, many times and I've never felt the need to go over and talk to him because he can just change like the, you know, like the wind. And I always think that Gene's, a bit, Gene's become a bit like similar to that sort of weird uncle that comes to a family gathering, but you sort of you tolerate him because he was nice to you when you were younger, but you really wish he'd just not say anything. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Do you know so what I mean? Bobby wanted to say something. Hey, Dave, this is a, yeah. so you're working with Glenn now. Eight years ago, I was at Abbey Road. I was doing a couple of things there, and I was there with Earl Slick. And, oh, good uh, man. Oh, yeah, man. I'm really close with Slicky, and uh, Slick's out with Bernard Fowler now and doing a Station Station tour. But um, yeah. two years ago, I was in Edinburgh, and Slick and uh, Glenn were doing the Fringe Festival. So, I mean, how long have you been doing stuff with uh, Mr. Matlock? Um, well, funny enough, it, it was 2002. At the end of 2002, I did some guitar for him, and we were going to get it. There was going to be a band, me, Glenn, Chris Musto, and maybe another uh, second guitarist. I'm not sure. We had a few rehearsals, and then um, there was a Glastonbury thing, and then and then Glenn gave me a ring and just said, he, he, you know, he, he, he was going to do something different or whatever. But we stayed friends and we kept in, in touch. And then you sort of fast forward to 2010, and. Uh, and he had uh, the drummer he had at the time was Javier from the Stereophonics. I don't know whether do you know the Stereophonics yeah. in in USA? Yeah. And so Javier was playing, but his diary was getting really, really full. And there was a tour of Canada came up, and uh, Javier couldn't do it. And so um, Glenn asked me, could I do it? And uh, and I said, yeah, of course I could. And um, and and and, I, and basically Javier. Uh, have you, I think well, after the Canadian tour, Javier came back for a couple of gigs, but he, he you know, the stereophonics kept pinching him, you know. Um, and eventually, I just became the drummer for Glenn Matlock and the Philistines, and we did, you know, European dates, and we just, you know, and that was um, so. For six years, I've been sort of in and out of Glenn's projects, and uh, you know, Glenn likes to mix it up and change it over and things like that. And um, you know, there's the Philistines has always been a sort of a band where the lineup changes quite a bit, but it, it, it hasn't changed for the last six years. But Glenn's doing something different at the moment. And um, like you said, he's got um, he's got an album coming out at some point with Earl Slick himself and Slim Jim Phantom. Yeah. And Stray Cat. And that's great. I mean, that that is a trio, I tell you. Um, that's that, that's going to be a good one. And um, yeah, I mean, Glenn's always just doing different stuff. I, I personally think, you know, the. 
he's the most punk of them all, really, despite the fact that he's <laughs> the least punk of them all, if you know what I mean. But he's punk in the fact that he just continues to do exactly what he wants to do. And, what it's all uh, about, man. Well, that's sorry, great. say that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, it's, it, you just cut out for a moment. Say, it's, what were you saying? Oh, uh, sorry, no. it's a Skype. It's coming through my phone. Yeah, no, no, I, I, this is, you know, this is just great. But, yeah, and it's so funny, just all the connections musically, and then it all leads back to the whole Kiss thing. And the map work. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, there was, uh, there was an album, uh, I did an album a couple of years ago with uh, under the name Atlantic Machine, and that was basically Jim Lowe's project. Jim Lowe is the guy that, he's a Grammy-nominated nomina- producer, He's done the last three number one Stereophonics albums. And he asked me to do the drums on uh, his Atlantic Machine album. And we did this festival in England. And uh, Earl Slick was there. And uh, Earl said that, you know, can I, you know, can, I'll come and join you for a song. I'll come and, why don't I get up and join you for a song? And, uh, and we literally sat in Jim's car, played him the MP3. Earl just sat there with his guitar, just playing along to it. And he said, yep, yeah, I got it. <laughs> like literally, he literally heard the song twice, you know, and then he came on at the end and I have got footage of it and I, I mean to put it up. I, I must put it up on YouTube at some point. But uh, yeah, that was a cracking night, you know, just just to just to play with Earl Slick. And uh, you think, I mean, he was Lennon's last guitarist, you know. And Bowie's, uh, yeah, uh, I played oh, at the yeah, Cavern yeah. Club with uh, he and Mark Hudson, who's a good friend of ours. Uh, Producer. Cool. Yeah. Hello. No, no, I, oh, I'm, okay. I'm still here. Yeah. Cool. So you see, I'm I'm, I'm English. You see, I, I I can't butt in. It's not allowed. <laughs> oh, not, it's not uh, proper. Uh, it's not proper. But no, I mean, you know, when I was when I was talking to Matt, um, uh, you know, or, or sort of exchanging um, messages with Matt and stuff, you know, the stuff I like I say, I'm never. Um, I'm never not blown away by the stuff that I've I've, I've done. You know, playing with Woody Woodmansey from uh, Spiders of Mars. As well, um, yeah. doing that, doing 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 stuff with uh, Lisa Ronson, who Mick Mick Ronson's daughter. Um, it's I mean it's it's great, it's great. There's there's not not any sort of aspect of music I don't like. My fear is that it's all going to end at some point, you know. No. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, like I say, <clears throat> this single that I've that you heard uh, you heard a track of and what have you. I'm, I'm obviously very excited about that because it's kind of. It's it's me, you know. When you're playing behind someone like Glenn Matlock, or you're playing behind Willie Nile, or you know, some whoever it might be, you know, you always know what your place is and stuff. And so this single is kind of, although it's got, um, you know, sort of Amy and Ed and uh, it did, it did. The Darkness were quite big in America, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. they were big. Yeah. Did they? Yeah, because I remember Ed on tour sort of ringing me from various places like the Kodak Theater in Los Angeles and. Uh, you know, sort of Irving Plaza and stuff, which is quite, they're quite decent venues, aren't they, selling them out. Um, but because, it, despite it having them on, it was basically, you know, that was my, my dream band. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's an exciting time to have this out. And uh, I, just, I just hope it reaches the people that like it, you know. Well, you just reached about a lot of people via the Kiss Room here on Monaco Radio. Is there anything else you want to say to everybody that's listening all around the planet right now? <laughs> Oh well, I wouldn't mind um, letting them know where they can buy it. <laughs> Absolutely, very cool. Um, well, I mean, first, first things first. Facebook, obviously, there is a Venus reaction, the Venus reaction Facebook. So just put that in, and uh, you'll see that the profile picture is the painting, which is on the front of the sleeve, and um, and it's available from www.burningshed.com. Excellent. And uh, Burning Shed deal with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of sort of rock artists and stuff, and uh, they're quite they're quite into prog actually. They they deal with all the King Crimson stuff and Porcupine Tree and all that sort of malarkey, um, as well as you know as, as well as new wave bands and what have you. But yeah, Burning Shed is what is one place, and www.themerchdesk.com. So uh, either of those you can get the single from. And it, it is, like your guy was saying about the necklaces thing, you know, it, <laughs> it is 500 worldwide. That's all there is. And uh, and I want it to be special, so I'm not going to repress it. It's not going to be, you know, the clear vinyl, picture, you know, the seven-inch single, it's 500 and then it's gone. And uh, there's there's one place that's already sold out. So uh, without wanting to sort of jam it at people, if you do want one, I'd, I'd get on it. So, uh, but yeah, like the Facebook page. Have a look at the videos and stuff. It's um, it's a band that's not a band. It's like a it's like a sort of fantasy band that I made up, and uh, but it's real, you know. 
That's fantastic, and we thank you for sharing that. Obviously, we're talking to David Donnelly. The band is called The Venus Reaction. You heard the song. Now you can go out and get it. Obviously, you can get the single he just talked about. It's limited edition. Kiss fans love that. And we're always happy to talk to other Kiss fans, and especially about the work or the art. And Jerry just killed my mic. Anytime you don't touch that button. That we all like to talk <laughs> about their uh, all of their uh, things that we're doing, and we really appreciate you taking the time to call in. Well, I'm just absolutely delighted to be on the Kiss Room because I listen every month. I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, most of the podcasts, the, the Science Theatre guys, Pod of Thunder, yeah. you know, all those guys. But I always tune into the Kiss Room because it's like, it's it's like having just a, it, if you haven't got a party, just put the Kiss Room on and you go <laughs> out and the party. It's a party. You know, that's that's how I feel. You know, when I play it, I, you know, the lights go down. You know, I light a couple of candles and uh, stick it through the stereo and enjoy all of you uh, talking about. You know my favorite band so uh yeah good luck to you all and uh, thank you very much thank and, uh, you i hope i'll be on again I'll, I'll come on again anytime you like fantastic well thank you david donnelly for calling in we really appreciate it yeah yeah matt just one more thing i, I just gotta say hi to candy you know yeah. you, you, our mutual <laughs> Because uh, uh, without Candy, I wouldn't have um, I wouldn't have actually discovered I don't think half the things that I did, you know. And, uh, and she's been a, she's been a friend of mine, uh, you know, for a while. And so, hi, Candy. And uh, if it wasn't for you, I probably wouldn't be yapping to these guys. And it's been brilliant. It's been brilliant. Woo. Well, thank you very much. We're going to reset top of the hour. We're going to talk to you again soon, and we're going to hear from the Kiss Room Houseman and talk about a party. We got it coming right up here in the Kiss Room.